That last program we did was a program that prompted the user for input. And when we received input, we added their number to a total. And at the same time, we counted how many numbers we were given so that we could give a final output with the total and the average and all that great stuff. I don't know if Logan put that. Did you get to post that to Discord? Uh, Could you post that? It's not that we'll need it again, but if somebody doesn't have it, it's a nice one to have for reference. So we looked at several while loops last time. And as you guys could imagine, we could write while loops forever. But what we really want to do is just practice and keep learning stuff. So we're going to practice some more. We need to also look at other kinds of loops that we can do. Because sometimes the while loop might not be the best example. So I'm going to minimize this. Yeah. We're kind of in here between week nine and week 10. So today we're going to talk about four loops. We had a few of those chapter five review questions that we left over until after we talked about for loops. So don't forget to go back and answer those because we probably won't have time in class. There was four or five of them that we didn't get to last time. And you should feel pretty good about this sum of squares program after today if you haven't already been working on it. That one is due tonight, so that's a pretty quick one. We also want to do this loops with turtle today together, and it should go pretty quickly. So we do have a lot that we want to do. Before we get started, let's look at this and talk about for loops in general. And then we'll see what we can do with the fancy turtle program. Should I look at this YouTube video? I'm scared. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I didn't check it earlier. Sometimes I have a different attitude. What? Row, row, row okay. your boat. Oh, it's like our last time where I was showing you the loops when we were doing musical chairs. Um, you can think about row, row, row your boat is a never ending loop, right? Because you can just sing it over and over. Now let's close it. I told you it was going to be a bad one. <laughs> okay, four loops. So we could say, you know, we want to do our row, row, row your boat three times. No matter what we're looping with, even if it's row, row, row your boat on a song, we have to have some rules. You know, the last thing we talked about before we left, the first thing we talk about when we get back. When we have a loop, we have to declare and initialize a loop control variable, something that controls our loop. We have to set up our loop condition, and usually our loop condition includes this loop control variable. And third, we have to increment the loop control variable or somehow update that loop control variable to check it again to see if we're ready to end our loop. So we have to have three basic things, a variable, a condition, and an update of our variable to have a loop happen. Now I want you to think about those because they help understand the for loop syntax. When we're looking at our while loop that we already did, we saw we can declare and initialize a counter just by setting up a variable named count and setting it equal to zero. We could set another variable equal to our ending value. And then in our while loop, we could say while the count is less than that ending value, do our loop body. So if you look at that notice, we have our declared initialization of our variable. We have our condition that we check our variable. And then we have our update of our variable in that while loop. So whenever we're working with Python, our while loops are always top controlled. We don't even have 
the option to do a bottom control loop. So it does make it difficult for us to think about that logically. But actually, I think people are, that get through the Python course and are using other languages that have bottom control loops are being better at using them because they know what they can use them for because we didn't have the option here. So it does work out. So our while loops, we usually have what they consider three main types. The counter controlled loop, like we were just looking at. We have the sentinel controlled loop. And the sentinel controlled loop is like the one where last time where we entered that minus one. So we're entering a specific value, a sentinel value to end the loop. And then third, we can have data validation where we can check to see if the user's input is between our acceptable range. And if it's not, we'll just keep asking them to input. So we can just kind of stick them in an endless loop until they enter the correct data. So all of those are really good uses for a while loop. A for loop is something that we can use um, in a lot of situations very effectively, especially when we know how many times we want to run our loop or how many iterations of our loop we want to have. The for loop syntax is a little bit different. It's much more condensed. So in a for loop, the only things that are required is the keyword for and the keyword in. So we can say for some variable that they're calling iterating underscore var in this shortcut here, for some variable in this sequence, do some stuff. Let's try that. Can you open idle? And I just want to open a file. And I don't want too much fancy stuff here. I just want to say for var, that'll be our variable, in um, 10. Is that a sequence? Let's try it. Print var. Let's print out my variable. There's not very much code there. Will it do anything? Run it and see. What should we save it as? Ooh, um, you can just save it as anything you like. Let's see, I'll probably save it as do loop testing. That sounds good. Let me figure out where I save it. I'll tell you, I think this one is on my OneDrive. Only about half my 120 folder made it to my OneDrive, so I guess I should ask somebody if I had too much stuff. Do loop testing. So does it run? Oh, it's mad at me. It says um, int object is not iterable. Do I need to put it in parentheses or something? Just doesn't like me. Well, we better go look it up. Open up a Google window and let's go search. That presentation said that's right. So, how can we do a Python for loop? What are we missing? The W3 Schools has an option right there. I'm going to try it because usually if they have stuff on things. It's pretty good. They have a bunch of stuff about strings. Oh, do I need that word range? You're going to see today with the activity that we do that there are some differences between the different versions of Python when we're looking at for loops. So you might have to do a little bit more digging than the things that are exactly the same. So let's put that in that keyword range. And it likes that, huh? Okay, so we have to do it exactly the way it wants it. But what did that do? Oh, it showed every number between 16. So, Where did it start? 
zero. Where did it end? Nine. Nine. Okay, so let's put that range. Okay, so look at it real close. So we want some comments here. Our range went from zero to nine on this. Our variable var was set to the range number to execute the loop body. Does that make sense? If you can think of a better way to say that, yell it out. Our var variable went from zero to nine. So it actually achieved that value. So notice that's a lot easier because Python took care of declaring and initializing our loop variable, var. It got declared and initialized it with the first value from our range. And our range started at zero and went for 10. Make sense on that for loop? Okay, so that's our basic, basic for loop. But we can do a lot more, as you saw as I was skipping through the W3 school stuff. Keep idle open and just keep that program open as we look and see some other options of what we can do with our for loop. This one, it says four letter in Python, and then we can print out our current letter. What do you think that one's going to do? Guesses? You want to just try it? Does that say how many letters are in the number? How many numbers? It could. It could say how many are in there. Thank you. I'm glad you're there. <laughs> I know what you're saying. I was stumbling over myself pretty bad. <laughs> and that's a really good guess. Let's see what it does. So we have this string Python. And what this for loop is going to do is for each time we execute it, it's going to give us the next letter in the word Python. And it will put that letter into our variable named letter. So if we have a string, Python will just loop through it acting like it's a whole bunch of numbers or whatever we want to consider it as. it work? Mm -hmm. Run mine, make sure it works. I was close, I didn't get the file. You were super close, that's how I like you to say. It's very <laughs> good. Okay, so let's put a comment here. Python becomes the iterator in this loop. Each letter in the iterator is assigned to the variable letter. Did you mean to misspell E? No, I meant to put E A. Why E A instead of E? Because that's a abbreviation for each. It's a comment. You can put whatever you want. Put what is meaningful to you. So if you want a bunch more, put a bunch more. If you want less, do. Just to, to make it where if you looked at it later, it would mean something to you. So however you want to put it in there. All right. So we can do a for loop with a letter or letters or words. There's our Python. What about this one? This one's different. In this example, we're going to see things that we haven't seen before. This is a list of fruits. So it's a list of different strings. So thinking about that, what do you guess it's going to output? This one is one of the ones that I have up on the door. So I might just make you guys go do them. Let's see. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay, let's split everybody up into some partners. Okay, so let me tell you what we're gonna do first. 
because I thought it was in here and it's obviously not. I've got it messed up. Hang on. Do do. All right, we're gonna assign a partner here in just a minute. Ooh. And you and your partner are gonna be given a color of post-it notes, okay? So this is your color, nobody else is gonna have this same color. So as you guys walk around, you're gonna look at all these different posters and you're gonna try to figure out what the output would be from that code. Oh. Now you can use your phones to do research to figure out what that Python syntax is gonna do. And you can do as much research as you want, just short of running to one of the computers and typing it in <laughs> to see what it does, because I don't want you to do that. But figure out what that Python code's output is gonna be. Now, after you figure it out, you're gonna write it on the back of your post-it note. Guys in the back, guys in the back, look at me. You're gonna write it on the back of the post-it note so that when you stick it to the big sheet, other people can't see it, okay? So I'm sorry to point you guys out, but that always happens. Okay, so next, after you've got one answered, you're gonna to go to another poster and you're gonna figure out what the answer is for it and write your answer on the back and stick it to the poster so that when you come around the whole way, You've got them all. Now you might have to do some crossing around to find one that's open, but try to not have two teams at one poster at the same time. We've got plenty of different posters to split everybody up. Then, yeah, you can use that list, whatever you want. Now, when you're done, there's this handy dandy function worksheet for your benefit, just to come up here and get one of these from me and turn in your post-it notes and we'll double check and make sure that you've got an answer on every single poster. Now, some of the posters are still the old Python syntax, so you might have to look at some stuff that's some old syntax. Some of the posters do some weird things. There are trick questions because that's what you're gonna run into in code. But they're all code that I found online just searching for if statements and loops for Python. So I thought, how can I get everybody to see all these weirdo kinds of conditions that people write? I know, I'll do it this way. Okay, so that one time we split up, was it by your birthdays that worked out so good? Because I think that did. Let's try that again. We were, we're missing some people. Oh, we're missing a lot of people today, but that's okay. As sick as I was yesterday, I'm not going to fault anybody for not being here today. Let's start with our January birthdays up here all the way back to December. Because you, know, you should end up with a different person than you did last time because we've got different people here. So, January, here. January up here. Our February, March. Are you guys all like October? It seems like there was something like that last time, wasn't there? You're all from October. So you're the only person that was born in the beginning of, come on down, if you guys think to be the beginning of the year for us. Okay, and I hadn't found how many people we had. Yes. Okay, we have 15. And Shirley emailed and said she was going to be here, but she had was having trouble with her car. So I don't know if she'll make it, but we'll decide a group that she'll join if she makes it. We're gonna have one group with three, and that'll give us another group with three. So count off to seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so our number one, come on up here and say howdy, and number two, they're doing it, come on up. Hi. They find your number three person. And number four person, and number five person, and six person, and seven person, and you can stay with them. <laughs> That'll work out. I think that's a good group. Okay. 
post-it notes and go ahead and get started. See what you can do. Keep those ones. There you go. Yeah, there's plenty. There's plenty. You guys got one. Just one color. Just one color. <laughs> I didn't know that what you were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am not worth it today. Okay, good luck. Get going. I'm going to set the clock so that we have enough time to finish up some of this stuff when you get done. So let's see how long it will take you. Uh, I, let's steal you, okay. Let's see. Okay, Jackie's going to show you that last program, what had to be changed for it to run in our new version of Python. Am I sharing? It's me. I have it hogged. Okay. Now you. I know. I'm just messing with you. Okay, so there's that code. You want me to run it real quick? Mm-hmm. Oh, why is it not? Oh, because I got to share this one now. I got to share that other. What? Can you switch here? Yeah. I don't know how to share this new one. You can't add it. That's weird. Huh. Oh. Oh, we can see that. Okay. Oh. Everything fancy. There you go. Okay, so in this code, we are doing a range to 10, which basically starts at zero, <laughs> the same as saying one comma 10. So let's try some things. Can you change that for us to say five comma 10 instead of just 10? What happens then? Yeah. Now notice our current output is all the odd numbers from zero to 10. Now if we change that beginning number, the number five, notice now we just have five through nine. Now, could you, on the third number, which we don't see after the 10, let's put a comma two. So we can specify the beginning, the ending, and the increment with a for loop. So far, we had just specified the ending. So let's try negative one in your increment instead of two. Can we go backwards? So it, we can only have three things instead of two. Instead of two. Uh -huh. Perfect. Just restart. Okay, you can't be a negative, right? 
Why I get mad at you? Try to get. I shouldn't be mad at you. Because you're going from five to one or ten. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so it knows it's going to be an infinite loop there, doesn't it? So change that ten to one or to zero. Very good. I always forget Python is that smart. It's like you can't make that infinite loop. I won't let you. It would be infinite the way it was because with the negative one, she never would have reached the ending number. So it would have just kept going negative into infinity. Okay, so there I take the negative. We just had to change our ending number. Looking at your results here, put this one back up. Mm. They all look really, really good. You should give yourselves a hand. Yay! Good job. Give yourselves a hand. You did really good. Everybody was really fast with it. Um, it can kind of be like a test. All right. You can unshare. Okay. Now let's look at your function worksheet real quick. First one, SQRT, what does that thing do? Square root. Square root. So how could we do that in Python? You find it? Kind of, but it hurt my head. So I'm like, hurt your head? <laughs> yeah. You can just write down it's SQRT. So it's basically the same. It's just that before we can use SQRT, we have to import the math library, the Python math library, into our program so that we can use all the math functions. So it's most useful to us to say math.sqrt. So that math library is just all the code for math things that <laughs> Python likes. At math.sqrt. Where do we put the import math in our code? Right at the very top. So at the very normally. Right. Mm -hmm. The very so first line. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it'll work if you put it right before okay. that function. But they normally put it at the top. Yeah. They like to put it at the top. So the import comes before comment, right? Doesn't matter. Just so it's up at the top. Now, what about int? Everybody knows that one. What's its? What does it do? Change to an integer. And what's our Python function for that? Don't we use that all the time? Nobody know? Sorry, what are you on? The int, what is its Python equivalent? It's int as well. Int as well, yes, we've been using that a lot. What about ceiling? Look it up, don't wait for me. C-E-I-L. C-E-I-L is the Python version. And what would you say that thing does? That one can be kind of hard to understand. Right, so ceiling for both of these numbers would go to 13. So it's not rounding, it doesn't care what the decimal part is, it's going to go up, right? Because it's ceiling. Now, the floor. 12.8 would go to 12, 12.4 would go to 12. So ceiling is going to go up one no matter what the decimal part is. Floor is going to go chop off that decimal part. Not round, so it doesn't do any rounding.
Now, the, the seal function for Python is named C-E-I-L. What is the floor function named? Floor. Good, so those ones, they do what they say, sort of. Now, what about random? Return the number between zero and one, but not one. Okay, so returns a decimal, a, an infinite, how do I say that? It's, it's a Python. less than zero value. Let's look at Python. Python is random. Well, we can just do all sorts of wonderful random things with Python. That's because this is the random library. So when we look at the random library, we have all sorts of capabilities. And we're looking for the function random. And it says it generates a random float uniformly in the semi-open range 0, 0.0 to 1.0. So again, that means from zero up to, but not including, one. So random is the function that we would use by default. But if you look at this, you see there's lots of other things we could do to, to specialize it, like to make it fit to exactly what we need. What about length of? In our textbook, they talk about the length of function, returning the length of a string. Can we do that in Python? Length of string in Python. So for Python, it's len. What about two upper and two lower? What are they in Python? So upper and lower. And then the last one, B-A-L. What does anyone know what it says in our book that function does? I think they're saying absolute value. So that would mean it's going to return a positive number. So if you had negative 47, it would return 47. If you had positive 47, it would return 47. So how can we do that in Python? We would have to search for absolute value. And it's ABS instead of VAL. So it is a little different. Now, if you guys will keep this, take a picture of it if you want to throw the paper away and you just want to have an, a digital copy. But keep this because a lot of times our textbook refers to these functions by this name. And if you have this kind of quick reference, you can just look to see what that Python function name is They're instead of having to research it. I know, <laughs> they're way far apart from each other. That's why I finally made this. <laughs> so I was like, this is craziness. For random is random. And the Python for val is ABS? ABS. Uh -huh. Yeah, because some of them are so close to the same, you don't even have to look, but then you can't remember which one was so close, you know. All right, so that's for you. Just keep it however you want. Let's, one last thing. We're going to try and get as much in here today as we can. Let's go to the Runestone Academy and look at that 
turtles thing that you have due tonight. So we can get it out of our way. Now remember, I'm gonna be looking at your score in the runestone thing. So make sure you do click through this so it'll show as you having completed it. We're gonna start out with this that says Python Turtle Graphics. Let's start out with Hello Little Turtles. They have a video intro for us. But we want to talk about this turtle module. They say there are many modules of Python that provide very powerful features that we can use in our own programs. Some of these can send email or fetch web pages. Others allow us to perform complex medical, mathematical cal calculations. I can't read today. In this chapter, we will introduce a module that allows us to create a data object called a turtle that can be used to draw pictures. Turtle graphics, as it is known, is based on a very simple metaphor. Examine, imagine that you have a turtle that understands English. You can tell your turtle to do simple commands, such as go forward and turn right. As the turtle moves around, if its tail is touching the ground, it will draw a line, leaving a trail behind as it moves. If you tell your turtle to, to lift up its tail, it can still move around, but won't leave a trail. As you'll see, you can make some pretty amazing drawings with this simple capability. Bless you. Now they have a note here that says the turtles are fun, but the real purpose of the chapter is to teach ourselves a little more Python and to develop our theme of computational thinking or thinking like a computer scientist. Most of the Python covered here will be explored later. All right, I'm gonna go. So let's look at this first little turtle program. We have this code that they've supplied for us. Let's take a look at it. First, we do this import statement like we were saying we had to do to import the math library. Only here we're gonna import this library for turtle. Then we create a turtle screen named WN. So we're setting up a WN variable for our window and we set that equal to a screen on this turtle program. Then we create an actual turtle called Alex. And then we tell Alex to move forward 150 units, then left, then forward again. So can we run this thing? Let's do save and run. So there's what the turtle did, our turtle named Alex. First, it went forward. So notice it started out in the center at one comma one position wise, and then it went and up. And so that's pretty much what we told it to do. Notice that it only moves on our command forward. The command left just turned 90 degrees to the left because that's what we told it, 90. Now there's a lot of great information here about our turtle. They want us to modify the program by adding the commands necessary to have Alex complete the rectangle. So let's do that. What do we need first? We're always going to refer to it as Alex. That's what we named this. So if I've got him, he's sitting here, he's just drew this line. What does he need to do next? Left. Left. So I'll tell him to go left by 90 again. Mm -hmm. And then forward. Um, I guess 150, because we'll be, we'll be closing off the top. So let's run that and make sure we get three lines. That looks good. So I want to go le left again for 90 degrees. And then this time I want to go forward. Our sides were 75. I'm going to run that. And then we should have our complete rectangle. You got it? Mm -hmm. 
Mine already has answers here. It says that the turtle starts out facing east. And here's a mixed up program. So let's put it in the right order. We have these code blocks. Mine are already kind of in the right order, so I'll scramble them up. That we need to drag from one side to the other. So if we look at our program up here, the first thing we needed was that import turtle. So let's find the code block that has the import turtle. I want it first. Okay, so this code block imports our turtle library, creates our window, and creates our turtle. So we're ready for our turtle to go. So it shouldn't matter, should it, which one we pick? I'll pick that and see if it matters. Says that works. Let's try switching those around because I think it would take it as long as we have the import turtle first. Oh, nope, it didn't like it. It wants us to do that 150 for our top, or I've got it broke. Yeah, it wants us to do that one first. Just like the one above, so it wants us to do it first. <laughs> now, here's some more turtle blocks. Again, I'm going to reset this so I'll look like you. Which one do we need first? Import turtle. Import turtle. Then what? Does it, I was going to ask, does it matter if we do window or Maria? Like, does it matter which? I don't think it matters. Okay. But let's do the same order they have then. So let's do our window. And then what? Now again, if we want our first edge to be the longer edge, I'll pull that one first so I can see if that's what they want. Now they want them to be in a different order. I'm not sure what, oh, they want it, I see. It actually says up here that they want it to be 75 first. So. Okay. Now next we've got one that says, this program uses a turtle to draw a single line to the west, but the program lines are mixed up. You can see here what order they should be in. If you wanna move yours to that right order, we wanna import the turtle, create our window, create, create our turtle object, which is gonna be Jamal, move it to the left, and then move it forward. Now there's lots more practice on this, but I'm gonna go ahead and click next. Do come back and try any of those activities anytime you want. It's all just really good practice for you. But now we wanna think about some other stuff here. Now we can have lots of turtles, just like we can have lots of different variables in a program, we can have lots of turtles. Each of our turtles is an independent object and we'll call each one an instance of the turtles class. Each instance has its own attributes and methods, meaning we could have Alex use a thin black pen and Tess might be using a fat pink one. So let's see what we have going on here. In this example, we have imported our turtle, created our window, and then we set a background color for our window. We're gonna set up a turtle named Tess, and Tess's color is gonna be hot pink, and the pen size is gonna be five. Then we're gonna create another turtle named Alex, and we're not gonna do anything to override any of the defaults for Alex. We have some commands here for Tess to move around, and then some commands for Alex. So let's run it and see what we get. I should have scrolled down. Let me run it again. Should be able to see them as they go. They're kind of independently moving around from each other. So they say two turtles might not be enough for a herd, but you do get the idea. 
Let's go next and let's look at our for loop. Now this is what we wanted to do here is our for loop. So as we work with our turtles, we can have some code that can get really tedious if we say like move forward 50, forward 50, forward 50, it can get pretty, pretty bad. So we can use a for list to help us with that. In this example, they have a list called name, and they actually are creating this list in the for loop. So they're saying for every name in this list, so each name in this list is separated by a comma, so we can see what all names we have in that list. So for each of those names, we would print out, hi, name, please come to my party on Saturday. Now they have a nice flow chart here for a for loop and they show you how you could run this again in that code lens that we've used before too. This is the same site where we've searched for visualized code and we've run it online. We can use that same code lens in the RuneStone Academy. So if you click forward, you'll see it execute that for loop over and over for each name in that list. Now we can use a for loop to make our turtle program simpler. So let's try this one. Here we import our turtle library, we set up our window, we set up a turtle named Alex, and now we have a for loop to say for zero, one, two, and three, do each of these things. So let's run that. Oh, and it does the whole box. So for zero, it went forward 50 and turned left. For one, it went forward 50 and turned left. Two and three. Now, like they say, saving code lines might be convenient, but it's not really the big deal here. What's more important is that we found a repeating pattern of statements. So we reorganized our program to repeat the pattern. Finding the chunks and somehow getting our program arranged around those chunks is a vital skill when we're learning how to think like a computer scientist. So those values made our loop execute four times, but we could have used any four values. So we could have really confused people and said for yellow, red, purple, and blue, or anything we wanted to repeat that loop four times. Now, if we wanted to actually set up our loop using colors, and we wanted those colors to be important, we could make them be part of our settings. So in this example, in our for loop, we're using four different colors and we're calling those a color. And then inside our loop body, we're actually using that color to set the color of our pen. So let's run that one. And you should see that as it changes sides, it changes colors. Now there's a lot more to look at here, activity-wise. Now the range function, we've seen a lot of these things today. We've really done a lot. So I wanna get this marked off in Canvas so that you guys don't have to worry about this assignment, but I do want you to come back and be going through it and trying some different things and looking at some different options here. So the range statement is just like we were looking at earlier. Instead of having to have zero comma one comma two comma three, we can say range up to four, and then it'll execute for zero, one, two, and three. The range function is lazy. It only produces the next element when needed. So it's pretty handy for us to use. Okay, they have a bunch more turtle methods here and some observations about things. And I think if you guys all click next, 
I can say that you're finished with this section. You could go to Canvas and turn it in or not, depending on if you want to or not, because you're done with it. But I do want you to go back to it. Now, because we're finishing this section close to Halloween, I'll probably add an assignment to create a Halloween graphic using Turtle. So I'll be thinking about how you might do that. Could you just, you know, go to a certain spot and draw something? Or what could you maybe do? We'll get creative with that and see. I'm gonna mark it as completed. Now mark yours as completed, but do go back and look at some of those activities and exercises. Did you ever have a friend who was really, really good at something? I had a friend who's like, she was like a cowgirl. She could, I don't know, rodeo, ride horses like crazy, stuff like that. I wondered how come she was so good at those kinds of things and I was so bad. And then I realized she had a horse. That helped. She practiced <laughs> all the time. That helped. I didn't have a horse. I didn't practice all the time. So I couldn't expect to get as good as she was. Same thing's true with programming. It's so weird. But practice actually makes you better. It may not make you perfect, but it's going to make you better. So if you're not practicing, you're hurting yourself. So make sure you're giving yourself enough time every week to get lots and lots of practice in. This runestone thing is like never ending quantities of practice for you if whatever you want to do with them. So get out of here. I didn't mean to run us up to the last minute. We had so much to do. This is on uh, the review questions uh, for number 13. It's mm -hmm. a multiple question, but on the actual book, it has. It it's down. It's further down. You'll have to ignore that first one. We ran into it later. I can't fix it once we start or I'll get it all mangled up. But we ran into that question again further on down in the right format. It's tricking you. We'll get lots more practice. Uh -huh. 